On our morning show from WRCO and WRCE, we have special in-studio guests today. State Senator Howard Markline is here, Representative Tony Kurtz as well from the area. Tony representing the 50th Assembly District and Howard the 17th Senate District, and good to have them here. They've been busy. Uh, good to have you here, Howard. Uh, you've been all over the place, haven't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, we have been busy. We've had... Uh, last week, uh, a lot of fairs uh, between Grand County and Juneau County. Um, I was in both of them. Tony was spent a lot of time up in uh, in Juneau County last week. Um, we've had uh, just a lot of you know just a lot of meetings going on. You know, um, economic development committee meeting uh, in uh, Grand County this week. Uh, our Farm Bureau annual meetings start this week. I've got three county uh, Farm Bureau annual meetings, which I can't make. All three of them, uh, unfortunately, but uh, towns association meetings uh, going on. Um, so uh, you know, it's we've been busy. So it's um, we haven't been, I haven't been home too much, which I guess is okay. So Tony, uh, for- Peggy, Peggy, Peggy doesn't mind that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Say. Yeah, she, she, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you have somewhere to go? <laughs> I know how that goes. <laughs> and yet, farm technology days, Tony, as well. Oh yeah, no, there was a lot of great activities. And once again, good morning to everybody. And uh, yeah, no, just a busy summer. And like you and I were talking, and we were talking before we went on air, just how fast the summer is just flying by. I mean, Howard and I had a wonderful time at the Juneau County Fair, which ended yesterday. And your fair is right around the corner, you know, September 6th. So, uh, yeah, it's a busy time of year. And unfortunately, summer's quickly ending. Yeah, it is. We could take the cooler weather. We're going to get that, it sounds like, some, somewhere along Eventually. 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 <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Someday. Oh, there is certainly some good news. Uh, I know you were certainly recently uh, real happy at the uh, Viola EMS uh, 50th anniversary uh, celebration. Yes, um, it was up there um, a couple weeks ago, I guess it was, and uh, to help uh, celebrate Viola's EMS's 50th anniversary. And uh, great opportunity for us to say thank you. And also, uh, it was entertaining to listen to some of the old timers, two of the original um, people, uh, EMS people were there and they uh, shared some stories of their the first runs and, and that kind of thing uh, that they did and uh, some of them were you know kind of pretty funny actually you know so um, and uh, so but it was good you know and um, y- you know again we just great opportunity to say thank you to them and uh, also um, we in between uh, the state budget that we just passed um, in June as well as the shared revenue bill that we passed in also in, in June, we made some significant um, improvements in our uh, rural EMS um, uh, package and <clears throat> more money, certainly for our, our rural EMS, um, that the funding assistance program uh, went from $2.2 million uh, annually to $25 million annually. So that's a significant increase, which our rural EMS units certainly need and made a couple other changes um, to uh, make the uh, national uh, registry exam, make that optional uh, at the discretion of the local um, uh, first responders, uh, EMRs. And so um, some, I think, will probably uh, keep the test and others will will make it optional, which is which is wonderful. So uh, and, uh, and a couple other things that, that will affect uh, staffing and that sort of thing for uh, rural EMS. And I think the important thing uh, is that, you know, the, our rural EMS units are different than Madison. They're different than Milwaukee. And, you know, and uh, I, we we're uh, persuasive enough to get that through the through the, the shared revenue bill and, and, and the state budget, and uh, which is great news for, for our uh, local EMS units. Definitely is, Tony. And, uh, you know, in, in your area, too, the EMS units, they can kind of choose what they want to do with that money, can't they? Absolutely. And like I said, we've, we've broadened some of the use, usage of that money. Before it was very narrowed, we broadened that. So it's going to be a lot more fun. Anytime Howard and I go and we talk about this, uh, it, it, the EMS, fire police they, they're incredibly excited about these opportunities and, and the increase in funding and i give you know senator mark Lyon a lot of credit that that national registry test you know it's something that he he's we've tried and particularly he has led on to try to get that to be optional and he, and he hit the nail on the head if it, like Moston, he howard and i were up there yesterday for the parade Moston's 
a ambulance service is, is going to probably keep the keep the registry test and and once again they can do that mm-hmm. or as maybe a casanovia which we've talked to many many times they're probably going to make that an optional t- test and that's the good thing about that based on your needs based on your area that's what that you know that ems director that's what that fire chief they now can make that decision if they want to do that or not. And, and like I said, I think it's a it's a win. Uh, it doesn't hurt the big departments like the Madison, the Milwaukee. They can still require it like they are, uh, but it's going to definitely help our smaller ones attract and retain people. That's the thing. That test we've talked about this in the past. You know, it's a it's a pretty cumbersome test it asked some questions that to be very honest i mean they were what, tire pressure or something like questions that you know an emr doesn't necessarily need to know but uh, our our big concern is is anybody out here that you know is thinking about getting into the emr emrs or ems please do so we are c- critically short we need volunteers you make make that program work and and it is a needed needed program because what we worry about which unfortunately has happened up in the northern part is folks just aren't showing up they'll call 911 and and unfortunately they just don't have the people to show up and just imagine in our area if something like that happened you call 911 you know and and nobody shows up that that i think um in this day and a that's unacceptable but once again it's all dependent on those wonderful EMRs, EMTs. Uh, that's why we got to be so thankful for what they do. And this, this, in my humble opinion, is a very small step forward to say one thank you, and then to give you more funding to help you. Indeed. Hopefully, that does help in recruiting. It's a daunting thing, maybe, for somebody that they don't want to take the test and they still want to volunteer their time, Howard. Absolutely. And for again, our rural units. The, the, the uh, flexibility that we're giving is for the, the lowest level, the EMRs, okay, not EMTs. And the idea basically is to get people interested at that first step on the ladder, that once they get involved in a unit and start, uh, you know, being a part of that unit, and you may realize that, hey, I want to take the next step to become an EMT. But if, if they don't become EMRs because of a, a, a hurdle that, you know, they, they, they can't, you know, fulfill – we never get them ever to even consider becoming an EMT. So um, again, it's just, it's a matter of flexibility and uh, keep the decision uh, on that uh, close to the ground. Keep it, you know, in, in the local community, because as Tony said, you know, uh, every community is different, you know, and um, the needs are different, you know, in our, um, even in our district, we've got, we have paramedics, you know, I've got paramedic services uh, in some areas. That's not going to change, you know, uh, they're, yeah, that's wonderful, but I've also got an awful lot of small little um, e- EMRs, and, and we need people to respond, you know, because otherwise, um, you know, just the driving distance. I, I've talked to, you know, and, you know, and again, in Madison, Milwaukee, I don't really think they can comprehend that it's, it's it's 35 minutes to, you know, in our area, 40 minutes to drive maybe, and, uh, to, you know, so uh, a, a paramedic paid unit is just that model just isn't going to work out here. Uh, we talked last time we were here, Tony, about uh, County Road O, and we've had some good work on that recently. Oh no, and I'm so glad that's something that uh, Senator Mark Line and I, uh, you know, very fortunate to get that in the budget. And uh, you know, I'm excited. I give Josh Elder, you know, the Highway Commissioner, a lot of credit. He he. He was at, in Madison several times, <laughs> politicking, saying, "Hey, this is the need for County O," and uh, I'm 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 glad we got the funding. Obviously, this is road construction season. I mean, if you anywhere you go uh, right now, they're doing a major part on 33 between Reedsburg going all the way into Wani Walk. So, a lot of road construction. This is just one stall, small step to help continue that because we do we we the last three budgets uh, really four budgets we've really invested in, in our infrastructure as we should uh, and you're going to continue that and uh, I'm, I'm just really thankful we got this in in the budget and get O oh, fixed howard what about uh, any status uh, any update on the bridge uh, there at lone rock um so i was over there a couple of weeks ago a couple three weeks ago i guess and uh this is the highway 130 uh bridge over the wisconsin river and uh from all accounts it appears to be going uh very well um and what's unique about that project is that um i believe that is the only project in the state of wisconsin that we're using design build uh, process okay um typically 
uh, for uh, projects, uh, you know, there's a separate uh, design phase, and then we go through the uh, property acquisition and the environmental impact studies and the archaeological impact studies and whatever. And the elapsed time is, is pretty uh, significant. And when I was over there meeting uh, with the DOT and uh, the contractors a few weeks ago, I asked the DOT, so if we hadn't um, used design build, when would this be done, this project be done? And the DOT guy said 2031. Now, wow. yeah, it's going to be done next year, end of next year. And so, again, um, they're able with design build to do uh, multiple things at the same time. There's a lot more flexibility. And uh, in, in my conversations with the, the DOT and with the contractor, they've identified a number of uh, cost savings um, um, areas, which is which is wonderful. So um, uh, that those uh, three bridges that is, are going to be replaced, uh, you know, they they don't owe us anything. They've been there for a long, long, long time, longer than any of us in this room, um, certainly. And so uh, th that bridge is needed. And um, I think when it's done, we're going to be uh, pretty happy with that. Especially, uh, we have a lot of people that you know um, work here in in Richland Center that live across the river or, or uh, go to work at Land's End, you know, in Dodgeville and stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of traffic um, over the, those bridges. And uh, also uh, the, the, uh, the uh, way that intersection, that T intersection in the south side is, is, is uh, right now, I mean, it's difficult for semis to make the turns. Uh, it's it just very, very difficult, you know, and so, uh, that's going to be alleviated as well. So uh, anyway, all in all, um, that was something that we pushed uh, the last budget. And uh, again, with the design build and uh, the big benefit uh, of design build is that in a complex construction project, it um, accelerates the time frame and, and hopefully uh, improves the, uh, the return of the taxpayers. It was interesting. It started uh, this year where they were flooded out. I mean, they had a serious situation, and now we're looking at sandbars in the Wisconsin River. Yeah, it's it's dry. It's uh, I <clears throat> cross the Wisconsin River uh, almost on a daily basis, going going someplace, and yeah, the river is really low, and uh, it's dry all over. I it dry at my place. Gosh, we. Um, I, in May on Mother's Day, we had four tenths of an inch of rain in my place. In July or in June, we had seven tenths of an inch of rain. July, uh, one whatever between one and two inches, and I mean things are dry. They still are dry, even though a recent rain. Yeah, it's still yeah. We had you know last week was wonderful. We had two point one inches last uh, Monday, so that was that was wonderful. Uh, but uh, yeah, we could use we could use quite a few of those kinds of rains. Uh, Waniwak area, it seemed like you were getting maybe a little bit more rain over there, or did I imagine that, Tony? I think you're imagining that. <laughs> <laughs> but to Howard's point, I mean, that we had an inch and a half at my place in Waniwak, you know, and it every every drop soaked in. But, you know, I know you guys are covering the extreme heat that's going to start, and, you know, that's just going to suck the moisture out and be very stressful on the crops. And, and you know, it's interesting, you know, our, our corn right now is in a critical spot, and I know the heat's not good. Uh, for that pollination. So, like I said, any rain <laughs> will take every every inch we can take. An update uh, possibly on uh, uh, broadband. Anything new in that uh, regard, Tony? Well, broadband, I think a lot of people have seen the, the federal money that's going to come down. I mean, just the federal money alone is going to be like $1.1 billion. And once again, what, what your listeners have to understand is there's a private match with that as well. So, you know, our estimates, and they're very conservative, but, you know, it, you take the 1.1, you take the private match, it, it could be anywhere from $1.7 to $1.8 billion that will be used for broadband. That's why in this particular budget that we just passed and the governor signed, we did not put any state money into broadband because all this federal money is going to be coming down. And I think, uh, you know, to be prudent – you know, let's use the federal money first, since there's going to be a, a, a lot of it. And then maybe next budget cycle, we got to look at what areas are we going to fill in that perhaps this federal money didn't 
didn't do. So there's a lot of money available. The issue now, and I, I just it's just funny, I was talking to Lynx Network at the county fair up in Juneau County because they're building out around Mauston right now with their fiber optics. Um, they think what we did was very prudent because of all this money that's in the pipeline. And I'm sure Howard probably knows the, the excess money that's still waiting to be allocated. But they're having problems finding crews. They're having fine problems getting materials, you know, so that is hampering and delaying projects as well. I mean, it's coming. That's the thing. You know, it, 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 anybody that gets fiber, it, it's night and day, uh, and it is coming. There's a lot of money available. It's just a matter of capacity right now. Have you seen progress where you live, Howard? I have, and it took a while, <clears throat> certainly. Um, the uh, Reesburg uh, Utility uh, is put uh, our fiber in in, in uh, the town of Spring Green, and um, you know what's interesting is uh, that project started, uh, I think, pre twenty eighteen with the design, uh, you know, and all that. There's a lot of engineering stuff that has to be done before uh, applications are submitted. So um, the at my place uh, we were uh, in phase three of that, so we just got uh, service uh, last month. Uh, through Reedsburg Utility, which is, you know, fiber and uh, which we're, you know, happy about. Um, it, t- it took a, took a long time, but to, to follow up on, on Tony's point too, you know, um, sometimes there's a long lead time between when some of these projects are on the drawing board, when they get funded and, and then when the, uh, the fiber actually goes in the ground. So uh, that was certainly the case with, with my at our, our place. And, and, uh, so, um, you know, Tony touched on, you know, the, uh, the capacity issues. Okay. And when it comes to broadband and roads, I, that's one of the concerns that, um, I always consider in terms of allocating money because, you know, like with roads, if our contractors are at capacity, they can't get any more done. They don't have the staff, they, you know, if, if, if we put more money into the programs, a, a road program, you know, what will happen? Uh, will we get more roads fixed and bridges done or will the price go up? Obviously, the price goes up. So and we've got the same thing, you know, with with broadband right now. And uh, during the budget process, um, I had a number of providers that in, in my district, local providers that said, please, please no more money. You know, their pipeline is so full of projects and with the, the uh, federal money that's coming down the road here that they, they didn't want any more you know, uh, state money at this point in time. So uh, I think what will happen is that um, once the federal money is deployed, uh, I met with one of the um, new commissioners on the Public Service Commission last week. And you know, once uh, I think what, we're going to see where that federal money goes. Once we know where that goes, I think down the road in the next budget, couple budgets, we'll be able to assess where the holes are. Where are the gaps that this federal money didn't cover? And then I think that would be a perfect opportunity for us, if needed, to, to backfill some of these holes uh, that the federal um, money didn't cover. Uh, broadband planning workshops going on. Do you know much about those? Um, I think there are some coming up. I guess I don't uh, offhand have uh, any of the, the details on that. So uh, I know that um, there's uh, some um, conversations about just helping people. Like where do you where do you where do you start? I guess I've that's often the question is like you know I we don't have broadband We're out in the country. You know, some places don't have broadband. How do you where, where do we start? So I think um, I, I think there's some. Um, the PSC has got some um, uh, meetings coming up on that. I know the other thing that uh, that you and Tony both have been seeing when you've been out and about talking to folks is uh, questions about the shared revenue bill. What right. can you say about that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, it's awesome. Um, that And that was something that I um, I don't want to take away all of Tony's thunder here, but <laughs> he, he started this about a year ago. And uh, with, with, uh, Tony Kurtz and Senator Mary Felskowski, Mary uh, represents the northern, northeastern part of the of the state. And the two of them, I think, got together uh, again last September-ish, started this this process. And, you know, we haven't raised uh, shared revenue for a long time. This goes back 20 plus years, I believe. And 
you know, the the problem wasn't just putting money into the formula. The formula was screwed up. We had different townships and communities getting uh, doing pretty well under their old formula and others not doing very well at all. And so uh, they undertook uh, the challenge of not just um, putting more money into it. I mean, actually putting the money into it is probably the easy part of it. It's what should that new formula look like? And then um, I think it was about in January, Tony, is when uh, the the scope of his project increased because uh, along came um, some concerns about what's going on in Milwaukee uh, with their pension problem. The city of Milwaukee and and Milwaukee County, and I'll let Tony talk about that. But anyway, so that got folded in, which complicated uh, his his efforts uh, on uh, on that. Um, And so um, I guess the important thing with that Milwaukee thing is that um, not a penny of money from this area is going to go into Milwaukee. It's a sales tax on Milwaukee city and county. If you go to a Brewers game, yep, you're probably going to pay a little bit, you know, a little bit more uh, in sales tax there. But for the rest of us, we're not, you know, it doesn't affect us at all. But um, I'm just amazed at the, when I look at the numbers, uh, which I have in front of me here, the increase in the shared revenue to uh, to Richland County, almost 800000 of additional money. City of Richland Center, almost 300000 But even like our townships, you know, uh, Buena Vista, you know, sixty thousand dollar increase. Um, I mean, there's these are these are big. Uh, Village of Viola, fifty six thousand dollars more and stuff. So, big numbers, you know, and uh, which our communities can certainly uh, use, and um, and it's got to be used for public safety. So, fire, EMS, and police, which <clears throat> is wonderful. So, and Tony, the price of things as everything has gone up. This is this is beneficial, isn't it? Oh my gosh! Well, just to, to Howard's point, so. Just to recap, I mean, I know we've talked about it before in the past, but shared revenue, obviously the state collects sales tax. And, you know, there was a formula years ago that was developed on how the share, how the state shares that money back to the municipalities. It could be the county, it could be the city, it could be the, you know, the the townships, like Howard said. And uh, that was frozen in 2004, uh, that number. Uh, and actually in 2009, due to a recession, it was cut. And then again in 20, I think it was 2012, it was cut once again. Um, so communities have not seen an increase at all. They've actually seen a decrease. And this, to your point, with the inflationary pressures we've seen, especially over the last three years, every community is getting, just like every household, uh, they're getting squeezed by those additional costs. So this is long overdue. It's, uh, you know, to be very fair, it, it kind of started because of Richland County. Uh, you know, this is something last summer, obviously the county uh, communicated with Howard and I about some of the financial troubles the county was having. I don't think that's anything new to people. Um, and that's when I reached out to the county's association, Wisconsin County Association. I said, you know, you know, is there anything we can do? Who's working on this? And that's when they told me that it would, uh, that Senator Fiskowski was working on something. I literally was in Hillsboro. I was carrying a gravity, pulling a gravity box and I pulled over and called Mary on the phone. And I said, Mary, you got, uh, you got anybody in the assembly you're working with? And she said, no. And that's kind of how it all started. Uh, kind of how it literally a year ago. And, um, then it just, it just went on from there. And, and to Howard's point, uh, the, our goal was basically just to help rural communities. I mean, look at the, the funding mechanism and, and try to get more funding to rural communities. And it's interesting before we did all this, like a township. So Richland County has all these wonderful townships. The townships in the state of Wisconsin, there's, there's, it represents 26% of the population of the state of Wisconsin. But before we change this, those townships were only getting about 5.6 or 5.8% of the shared revenue dollars. Once again, represents 26% of the population, but was only getting like 5.5, 5.6% of the actual shared revenue dollars. So that those were one of our biggest focuses. How do we try to... I mean, you're not going to level it, but how do you get more more money to rural communities? And so now under this new formula, you know, instead of 
like I've said, 5.6. It's almost almost close to more to 11 percent of the shared revenue dollars are coming to township. So it's more than doubled. And you can see that from the totals, like, like Howard was mentioning, like, like a town of Marshall town of Marshall right now gets uh, a little over $40,000 in shared revenue. They're almost going to double and they're going to get an additional 39,000. So that's very similar to all the different townships around our state. They're going to see a, a, a big increase and trust me, our townships are ran very uh, frugally. And I think they're going to probably invest a lot of that money in, into roads and infrastructure. I mean, it's interesting. We said, like, we, Howard and I, we're proud to represent the town of Clearfield up in Juneau County. And they, their town hall has no running water. They really? Like, no, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, there was an article recently, I can't remember, it was Journal Sentinel, about another township up, up in northern Wisconsin. I think it's in Mary's. Fiskowski, once again, no running water in their town hall. You know, they've they got a porta potty outside. So when we tell our colleagues on the eastern side of the state, obviously the suburbs around Milwaukee and Green Bay and Oshkosh, and, you know, they hear about a, you know, a, a government facility, a town hall that has no running water, just like you said, huh, really? <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. I mean, and that's not, that that's not out of the ordinary and so uh trust me the these townships and, and and the county let's be honest we know the financial struggle, struggles of the county i mean they're going to get an additional uh close to eight hundred thousand dollar increase uh and i i sure hope they use that you know prudently it has to be like howard said it has to be used for fire ems dispatch it can be used for infrastructure roads bridges um and so um and and I know they'll they'll spend that money wisely. A caller uh, asked this question. Of course, we have a U.S. highway that runs right by us here. But mm-hmm. are any plans for Highway 14 four lane, and you know maybe some reworking of that or working in the future? Um, I think there is, but I, it's not going to be anytime soon, from what I have gathered. Um, um, I met with uh, Rockwell um, a few um, weeks ago, and uh, they asked too about it and stuff. And they're very concerned about the impact on their access in, into their uh, plant there and stuff. So, but um, it's not. It, it isn't like it's an imminent, you know, going to happen here in the next next couple of years. So, unfortunately, I mean, this road, uh, you know, it's. I drive this often, and it's. It, it needs attention. It needs a, a lot of attention. So one of the things that we did do in the budget was um, there's a connecting highways um, allocation for communities that have um, major highways going through them. And so uh, we had a significant uh, 25% increase in the in the amount of the funding for that. Uh, and the city of Richland Center uh is one of the communities that's going to benefit from that. So, you know, you're looking at the, the Dodgevilles and Mostons and Lancaster and, again, any Platteville, any of those communities that have got major highways going through them. And uh, so that increase will be, uh, I think that starts next next year as well. So, again, that, but that's more for maintenance. That's just, you know, for maintaining it, not, not redoing it as we need out here. Sounds good. We'll have more on the morning show coming up here with Howard Markline and Tony Kurtz on our morning show Monday from WRCO. State Senator Howard Markline is here today in the morning show with us and Representative Tony Kurtz as we talk about things affecting our area and the state of Wisconsin. I recently read a publication, I don't know if you, maybe some scare tactics or whatever, but talking about the brewers in Milwaukee and losing the, the brewers to another town. Uh, have you heard anything lately? Oh, we've heard a lot about yeah? that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have. You know, that this, this is another discussion, and obviously Senator Markline, uh, you, you, this has been going on really since... Which, since January too during the budget and and the, so I'll just tell you my position. This is me talking. Um, the brew a lot of a lot of people don't realize that when a team like the Cincinnati Reds or the Chicago Cubs they come and play in Milwaukee, we actually get a portion of that player's salary as income. All right. So some of the if. We don't have the stadium. We don't have the brewers. Guess what? We lose those salaries from other players. And, and that that number 
If you look at player salaries over the years, that number actually has increased drastically. I mean, if you look Mm -hmm. at some of these player salaries. So the other thing is that stadium, a lot of people don't realize there's a stadium district. Well, when you really peel back the onion, the state owns the stadium. So the question is, what do you do with an empty stadium? Uh, the stadium also generates sales tax. You know, when some, everybody comes in, watches a game or a concert, that generates sales tax. You lose the stadium, you lose that also. So some of the, the thinking is, you know, you would use that sales tax that's confined to the stadium. You use those players' salaries that we are collecting, and then you would use that as the state's commitment to try to keep the brewers in, in in the state, I would like to keep the Brewers. I'm, I mean, I, I think they they add to our state, and if we can come up with some type of a formula where basically those salaries and the sales tax at the state that the stadium generates used to invest in the stadium, I think that's something that that I would be willing to support. So. Are there scare tactics though from from owners, Howard? Just you know, you know, hold kind of hold it over the state that hey, we're going to move them if you don't do something and that kind of thing. Well, we saw the same thing with the Milwaukee Bucks, <clears throat> you know, a few years ago, you know, and um, of course, I mean, they're, they're smart people. They're negotiating. So, you know, uh, if you don't love me, I'm going to leave, you know, kind of thing. So, but I would like to um, just to follow up uh, on what Tony said. Um, and I think my um, decision on the Brewers, whenever that happens, is going to be based pretty much on the um, calculus that I use for the Bucks. Okay. The Bucks, same thing. We're going to, you know, if you don't build a new stadium, we're out of here, okay? And so um, we ended up, um, the commitment from the state of Wisconsin, and again, same deal. We own that stadium, you know, that, you know, the old uh, uh, arena was owned by the Bucks or by the state taxpayers. So the deal with the Bucks is that we uh, were going to commit $4 million for 20 years, okay? Now, the state of Wisconsin receives income taxes on the uh, on the Bucks uh, salaries. Like one half of the season is played in Milwaukee, the other half's on the road. So half the uh, Bucks salaries are, ta- are taxed here. And then if Levon James uh, plays here, you know, and so there's a settlement sheet that we we get from the NBA. Right now, we are collecting in state income taxes fourteen million dollars a year. Okay, mm-hmm. um, just we, on the bucks, on the bucks, that's right, on the Milwaukee bucks. Okay, okay. we're up, you know, and and I'm I just looked at this, I you know I'm not, um, it's been a long time since I've been to a bucks game, you know I, I don't know I, I don't follow them that close and and you know I, I I'm not emotionally invested at all. For me, it was just strictly a financial calculation, and we made money from day one with the Bucks Stadium. And right now we're making ten million dollars a year, and every year we make more money because that four million stays fixed, and the salaries go up, and the state of Wisconsin get, makes more money. So, uh, and I just had a conversation with somebody last night about this, and they were leading into the the Brewers deal, and I and I don't know what the Brewers deal is going to look like, but you know it, it's got to be uh, financially um, worthwhile for the state of Wisconsin, and there's got to be skin in the game, you know. And the other thing that um, I think or I'm hoping that happens is the lease agreement between the Brewers and the stadium district is pretty uh, one sided, I would call, you know, in, in, in terms of um, concerts, who gets the parking revenue from concerts and that that all goes to the Brewers, even though I mean that. So I'm hoping that we can use this opportunity if this happens to have them renegotiate that lease agreement, and make it. What I fairer to the to the taxpayers uh, of the state, but uh, I'm not I'm not weighing in. Uh, I've told uh, I've told the brewer management, you know, whatever. I, you know, I, I um, give them a hard time once in a while. I said, "Are you still playing in Milwaukee?" And anyway, but <laughs> um, so anyway, but um, you know, it, it's got to make sense. It's got to make financial sense. It's got to be a good deal for the state taxpayers. Otherwise, I'm a no. That's interesting, and I hadn't thought about the players you know, that are coming in here being taxed. But it's the same thing uh, for a concert. If uh, Alan Jackson yep. comes in or Luke Combs, they, they have to pay state income tax Absolutely. in Wisconsin, don't they? Yep, yep, yep. Another thing, a week ago today I was up in uh, Green Bay for the kickoff of the 2025 draft, okay? And in the budget, 
we committed $2 million not to the Green Bay Packers for the 2025 draft. It was tw- we committed $2 million to the Green Bay Visitor and Convention Bureau. They're the ones that are organizing the event and, and, and uh, need, need to raise the money. Now, again, the, the impact to the state of Wisconsin of the draft next year, this is going to be in April of 2025, is $94 million economic impact to the state of Wisconsin. I can tell you the Wisconsin Dells Visitor and Convention Bureau is really interested in it because there's going to, there's going to be uh, about a quarter of a million people coming into the state. There's going to be people staying probably in Wisconsin Dells traveling to, to Green Bay. So the uh, they estimate that 70 million people will uh, be watching that on TV. It's just a huge impact to the state of Wisconsin. So again, that $2 million that we committed to the, not to the Packers, they didn't go to the the Packers, um, that is going to return mul- that multiple times to the state of Wisconsin in terms of, uh, of uh, just sales tax alone is going to be huge. If you have a wedding or you're looking at getting a room at that time, you better kind of book it now, <laughs> book right? It now. Yeah. <laughs> but to Howard's point, that just brings more attention on our, on our beautiful state. And, and mm-hmm. my, my opinion, you know, if the state does well, obviously our, you know, Richland County, the beautiful Driftless is also going to do well. What, what I, I want to I don't want to mean I digress for a moment, but on that back to the shared revenue, mm-hmm. remember we were talking about how stagnant it was for years. The other big thing about the shared revenue package now, those new supplemental aid numbers are tied and the, and the old shared revenue number are tied to sales tax growth. So what that means is, you know, if, let's say a community was getting $100,000, sales tax goes up 3%. You're going to get your next shared revenue payment the following year is going to go up 3%. That has never happened before. So to Howard's point, and what I guess what I'm stressing is the better our state does, the better our communities are going to do because the sales tax growth, basically this is, I don't want to say necessarily it's an inflation hedge, but it is that, that there will be some type of cost of living in that new shared revenue number. So state does well, our communities are going to do well. You know, and if you're the town chairman for the town of uh, Rockbridge or um, on the village board in Casanova, you ought to be just happy as heck that the NFL draft is going to be here in 2025. That's right. Right? Sure. Sure. I'm like, more money. It's more money. More money coming into the state. That means more money for Boaz and Casanova and all, all of our communities here in, in uh, Richland County. Maybe they'll have to stay at some bed and breakfast in Richland County for you the know, draft. You know, yeah, you bring up absolutely. a good point. I think the the opportunity is for us in southwest Wisconsin. How can we tap into that? Because there's a quarter of a million people coming into the state. And, you know, some are going to come in for two days and get out of here or two or three days. But. Um, you know, how can we capitalize on that and get some of those people to to venture out here and stuff? So, I mean, there's there's an opportunity there that once we got people in from Arizona and Georgia and all over the this country to, uh, you know, maybe spend an extra weekend uh, in, in southwest Wisconsin. But to, to, your, to your point, they might come in, but you're going to have the others that are going to stay for a week. Right. You know, I'm going to go to Wisconsin. I might might. Might explore it, come down to the Driftless. Right. So I, I think we have a great opportunity. Indeed. We'll have a final word coming up here on the morning show in just a moment. On our final portion of the morning show, a few closing comments here from Howard and Tony. Uh, in the news this morning, Howard, I saw that uh, Wisconsin Republicans proposing a bill that would uh, do away with work permit requirements for 14 and 15 year olds in the state. Uh, anything you can update us on that? I haven't looked at it. Okay, that, that came out I think Friday after late Friday afternoon. I don't even know who the bill authors are, and I've been at uh, fairs and all that all all weekend, so uh, I have not had a chance to look at it. Tony, have you heard anything? Nope. Uh, that's something I'll have, to, I'll have to take a look at it also. Certainly, it's something to try. You know, you're, we need more in the workforce, that's for sure. Well, I, I know anywhere we go, uh, <laughs> just yesterday, it, it's workforce, workforce, workforce. So I'm sure, like I said, I, I, I'm sure the author's intent is just try to get more, more people into the workforce. So. Fall session right around the corner here, right? Yeah, yeah. I, um, we're scared. We've got some floor dates, I think, uh, tentatively on the calendar here in, in September. So um, I'm sure in the Senate we'll be taking up a number of confirmations. Uh, 
and uh, as well as legislation. There's been you know a number of committee meetings that have been held throughout the summer, so a lot of those bills have gone through the process, and we'll be ready uh, for scheduling on the on the uh, floor um, in uh, September. You've been doing some uh, work behind the scenes on on mental health and some of those uh, topics. As yeah, well. so mental health is a big issue, and you know one of the things that um, is a big issue in Southwest Wisconsin is if we've got somebody uh, in cri- mental health crisis, they're 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 in crisis. Okay, in, in Richland Center, what happens? They call law enforcement. They call the uh, police department, sheriff's department. That person is taken into custody, so to speak, taken to the hospital for a medical evaluation to f- figure out what's what's wrong with that person. And then, if they, if they are you know are in um, still in crisis, that person is transported to Winnebago uh, Mental Health uh, Institution in Oshkosh. Okay, usually it takes two officers uh, or deputies. It's a, a long trip. It's an expensive trip. Uh, it's not good for that person in crisis. They're now sitting in the back seat of a, a squad car for a long trip, which isn't helping their mental health condition. So. Uh, we are working on uh, with the sheriff's departments, with the county association, the hospitals working on uh, it's called the crisis now model. Uh, we're working closely with the uh, Department of Health Services, and um, we think we're we're getting very close. We're working on drafts of legislation that um, DHS um, says we're going to need, and uh, it's my hope that we can get that um, uh, to the floor sometime here over over the next several months. Tony? No, I, I, I'll, I give Howard a lot of credit for that. That's something that has been an issue for uh, years. Um, and, and you have to think about it. Like you, you take Richland County and you just take two deputies off patrol have to transport somebody up to Oshkosh, which is probably from here, what, close to four hours one way, if not. And then so round trip. So it, it – and to, to Howard's point, just the mental state of that individual, uh, you know, they don't they don't necessarily need to go to Winnebago. Is there other alternatives? And that's something that we've been trying to research. And Howard and I have had numerous meetings with different organizations, the hospitals, to try to figure out some type of model. And so I give him a lot of credit working with the administration and DHS to come up with some type of solution. That's That's been an issue for for years, unfortunately. We've been hearing a little bit more about a new hospital here in Richland Center, too. I know they're working pretty hard behind the scenes on that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was in uh, Darlington. Uh, they, they're getting a new hospital. Are they? Um, yeah, so I was there a month, a couple months ago, I guess it was, for the groundbreaking uh, down there. But, uh, yeah, that's exciting um, opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I've, I served for 10 years on a community um, hospital board and was the chairman of that board for, for four years. And so, you know, facilities are important. It just, um, it is. It's important for um, the patients, obviously, but it's also very important as um, hospitals are recruiting um, physicians and uh, and nurses and stuff. So, um, yeah, it'll be, uh, if that uh, hopefully comes to fruition here, I know they're waiting on, I think they're still waiting on the, uh, um, word from USDA in terms of the, the funding there. And uh, so that would be an um, incredible um, achievement here in the community if that can happen. You've had that in your area. Mauston has a nice facility. Too. Oh, yeah. Well, Mauston has actually remodeled. Uh, you have Hillsboro, mm-hmm. which uh, obviously has a new hospital. But, you know, I was here, uh, was it about a month ago, where they had a, a public meeting there at the high school Uh, i thought the the hospital and the the contractors actually did a very good job there's some great questions from the audience i know some people are saying why do we need a a new hospital you know the nuts and bolts of it is is facilities get to a point where they're too old to fix if that makes sense i know a lot of people especially if they're very frugal what you know let's just fix what we have there is a point where it costs so much money to upgrade that where it's actually better to build new. And, and that's where the hospital's at now here. And, you know, being a critical access hospital, you know, Howard, ha- Howard and I have a lot of critical access hospitals. If you think about it, we need that here in this community. We got to have it sustain, sustainable. So I'm so glad they're, you know, they're, they're going to build this new hospital. It is a funding issue. Obviously, we talked about inflation, you know, the cost of a hospital four years ago is a heck of a lot different than what it is now because of material costs and labor costs. So I know they're working hard. Uh, I know we're 
you know, we're doing everything we possibly can, but, but I am excited. And, and once again, being a critical access hospital, you got to figure how far we are from lacrosse or from Madison, you know, those minutes matter to save somebody's life. And that's so why it's so important to have a hospital here in Richland center, have a hospital in Hillsboro, you know, Darlington. That's why it's so important to have these critical access hospitals because truly minutes do matter and save lives. So I'm, I'm excited for the community. I give them a lot of credit. The national spotlight shines on Milwaukee with the the Republican debate. First one, uh, you guys going to pay attention to that and watch that? I don't know. I've got I think three meetings scheduled on uh, Wednesday night: uh, two towns meetings and a Grand County Economic Development Committee meeting on Wednesday night. So uh, probably not. Have to set the VCR. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be some fireworks, but uh, yeah, I've got I've got some meetings too, so I probably won't be there. Watch it after the fact, maybe. Yeah, maybe. So, all right. Well, gentlemen, thanks a lot for coming by this yeah, morning. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, and once again, we got some heat. I know you guys are talking all about it. Just you know, watch one another, watch elderly and pets and things like that with the excessive heat in the next couple of days. Yeah, so. word to the wise. Yeah, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Phil. State Senator Howard Mark Klein of the 17th Senate District and Representative Tony Kurtz, Representative of the 50th Assembly District, on our morning show today.